uh, first of all, to Dolby, thanks for, uh, thanks for hosting this. And um, I have to say all the contenders were amazing, but I, I, w I just want to highlight um, Roma in particular. I saw Roma in an Atmos theater on the Upper West Side and was just blown away by the soundscape coming at me during that film. Um, they were all amazing, of course, but this one in particular, it's so subtle and so beautifully wrought. Um, and without, without the system, without the Atmos system, I, I, think it, I think it's not the same film. So uh, you know, thank you for, for bringing this technology together and for, for all that you've done for the film industry. It's, it's massive. Um, so uh, production design for Black Klansman um, started with a phone call from Spike. He said, we want to shoot this movie. Um, takes place in Colorado Springs. Um, so where are we going to do this? And I said, well, we, we definitely don't need to go to Colorado Springs. We're, we're going to shoot it in New York. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. We got, we, we got it all figured out. So I had not figured this out at all. So I immediately called the uh, location manager. I said, Tim, we've got to figure this out. Got to figure this out now. Because taking the, a movie this small all the way to Colorado Springs really eats a lot of your resources. There's not a film infrastructure there uh, to support making a film like this. And it was not a huge film. It's, a, it's about a $13 million movie, which is the, it's the uh, smallest version of a major film. That's the cutoff line is $13 million. So we were... We were a tiny, big, tiny major feature, basically. Um, so everything was done on a, on a bit of a budget, uh, tight budget. Um, here's the team. Team consists of me. Oh, going back. Marcy Mudd is the art director. Uh, she's like the project manager. If I'm the architect of the film, Kathy is the set decorator. We make the walls and design the walls of the set, and I. You know, I'm involved in all of these aspects, but the art director is responsible for, for making the set uh, a playable space, but Kathy decorates it and creates all the, the, you know, she chooses all the sofas and chairs and drapes and everything and all the little things that, that make it matter. Dave Lieber, assistant art director, draws the scenery for construction. Uh, we had one really big draw, uh, um, built set in this show. And Emma is, uh, is graphics. Uh, and Spike's a very big graphics guy. He always needs a lot of graphics. He likes to use them to tell his stories. If you've seen She's Got a Habit, it's just a wash with, with graphic content. So um, it's a very, very important position in the show. So these are all other jobs that, that are you know, great in, in the production design world as well. All right. Um, so the concept for the film is pretty simple. There's three parts to the film. There's Ron's world, there's Felix's world, and there is the police world. Ron's the enlightened man in an ignorant world. So his spaces are much, much cooler, progressive, um, smarter, hip, and consistent, um, connected to the now with a practical view of his past and a clear idea about his path and future. This is straight from the pitch that um, we did to Focus Features. Um, it's like once, once we get pretty far down the road, we have, to, we have to show the studio what we're doing. And this was, this was in my pitch presentation to them. Felix is the ignorant man in the progressive world. So the story we were trying to tell with Felix's house is that it was backdated like his ideas, antiquated ideas in an antiquated setting. So his house dates back, and I was thinking about like, how do we tell that story? And so we found an older house from the 40s, 50s, and we used that to show how, you know, how visually his ideas are like his decor, basically. Um, so to make the story even richer, we assume that this house is maybe his parents' house or his wife's parents' house that they have bought and taken over. Um, this one note, um, the scary thing about the rise of the, of the, the alt-right is that they're everywhere and you don't know where they are. And I think this movie shows the beginning of that moment or, or an early part of that, that movement. Um, so I think it's important that we didn't show them as just 
you know, rednecks in a, in a back room um, plotting things. It's, it's bigger than that. And, and so the house is kind of nice. You know, Felix's house, it's not a bad place to visit. You would not want to stay there. Um, and the police department now is, uh, is a building built 15 years ago in, in need of a facelift. Uh, so it's tobacco stained and, and has, has, is starting to, to fade in its glory. Um, few band-aids have been applied, but Ron is entering a physical world that needs drastic change, change if it is to continue to stand. And that's the visual metaphor, is that this is a space that needs renovation and change. So that's, that's the basics of it. If you can't tell the story of the production design in three sentences or four sentences, then it's not going to hold together very well. It has to be pretty simple and clear. Whether or not people actually understand it immediately, they, they kind of shouldn't. Um, production design is, is a, is a uh, subversive art. You kind of get into, get into people's brains from, from um, a visual standpoint, and it starts to accumulate over the course of a, of a picture, um, rather than beating people over the head with it. Uh, so, this is our Colorado Springs research. Um, this is what it actually looks like. The big feature of it is Pikes Peak in the background. So you can see it's a mix of, of old and new buildings, um, new 60s, new 60s-ish, 50s, 60s buildings, and uh, turn of the century stuff. Um, and this is our location up in Ossining, New York. So you can see, if you look at the top right picture and this picture, we're doing okay, and, and uh, it was even confirmed by the date on the top of this building on the right, 1874, so we're in the right range. Um, so this is the way it looked on the day. We just changed uh, a few things, added some period vehicles, uh, got rid of you know, stuff that didn't, that didn't look correct, and, um, and we had a downtown that worked really well. Police department, this is some of the reference. Uh, there's this great book called Police Work. Um, which shows how, how policemen actually did their jobs back in the 70s. Um, and this was some of our reference from that, that book and other sources. I also leaned into sort of 50s, mid-century architecture for this set. And you'll see some of these things in the final set that we built. You'll see like that square um, light fixture on the left there. We sort of adopted that. We adopted this wood paneling here on the right. Love the blue in there, so I grab that. It's like you do this research and then you, you appropriate things and, um, and work them in in different spots. The staircase, the suspended staircase, we did a very small version of that. And we, we also spent a lot in the ceiling in this set. It was a big, it was important. Spike moves very quickly. He will shoot 10, 12 pages a day. Some directors, most directors, Four or five is a, is a big day. Uh, Spike's fast. He does all of his coverage um, while he's shooting the scene. So it's, he'll have three, four cameras set up, always getting all of his coverage immediately. Um, it moves things very quickly. So knowing this, I knew we wouldn't have a lot of time to reset lights, and the DP is also going to be behind. So we tried to finish the space as much as possible and light it as much as possible with the, with the DP's um, input and collaboration. So the ceiling was, was very much finished. Flip the lights on, turn some things off here and there, and just go, shoot. Let him, let him run wild, and he did. Uh, this is our exterior for the police department, which is uh, in Ossining also, or Haverstraw, this is in Haverstraw. Um, and this is what it looked like the day we dressed it. So uh, this was our big built set, which was the, the police precinct. We've got, we've got, all this was on stage. Uh, bullpen, sergeant's office, narcotics, records, chief's office. Um, and you'll notice that the records room is sort of sticks out of the set. Um, and that's because the, the DP looked at the first model after I had already designed the whole thing and I had it in this nice compact square, right, which fits very well on the soundstage. And he looked at it and we were in the model looking at things and he was like, you know, you should make the records room twice as long. Okay, so we did it, and you'll see from the, the shots and stuff that he, he really used that set to, to full effect, that one little piece of it, and I'm so glad that he pushed me to, like, to, to extend it, because it looks twice as good.
This is a little fly through. This is done in a program called SketchUp. It allows you to mock up things in 3D and show different camera angles. Um, and this is what I showed Spike after I had finished the, the design to, to get him to buy into it. And then you get to go into the set also. There's Ron's desk. And you'll notice Ron's desk, everyone is turned away from him. That was on purpose. Trying to ostracize him and put him in a corner. Um, but I didn't want to put him in the other corner because it didn't have as good a background and you'd sort of get stuck. You don't want to be stuck up against a wall with a character like this. So I put him against the glass instead. All the glass gimbaled, which means you could, you could move it to avoid um, reflecting back on yourself with camera. Um, but that way he had a very interesting, that right there, a very interesting background, um, which is helpful. That's the chief's office. So in doing this, I show Spike, like, here's the main camera angle is if you're going to go over the shoulder at the desk, um, walking through the hallway, here's the records room. And you'll see, just imagine this place half as deep, and it's really not as good. Twice as many shelves to dress, but worth it. Well worth the effort. This is literally how this scene plays out almost. Lots of hallway. It's important to make, if you have work in hallways, it's important to make it sort of like a warren where you get lost so people don't know where they are all the time geographically in the film. And then the narcotics room had to feel like it was in the basement. So we put the windows up high, and then we made the, the, a set of stairs that went up, go through a door, and immediately went right back down. So you never shot the, that in one. It was always two separate shots where you could look at the stairs coming down into the basement area without, you know, without needing to build a whole, a whole different set. So it all works together. That's like, it's right in here, right? You come through here, you go up the stairs, and then right back down the stairs into the narcotics area. So here's some matching shots from the model and what we actually did. You can see all the details added. This is right when we uh, were all dressed and ready to go. There they are. You can see the blue colors that we brought in. You can see some of the uh, ceiling work that we did. Lots of detail. Um, this is uh, what Kathy does, the set decorator. She puts together a board of the different materials and different furniture that we're going to add to the set. And then we talk about how it's all going to work. Chief's office, dressed, there the guys are. Here's Ron. Narcotics. So on the Colorado Springs Police Department sign, there are four pieces of gum, which is mine. <laughs> Every time I'd walk through, I would put my gum on the sign. I was I kept asking people on this, you know, on the team, on the crew, to, to put their gum on the sign. I'm like I'm not putting my gum on the sign. I'm like I want the gum on the sign. <laughs> put it, but nobody else did it. So that's kind of gross. But that's my gum. <laughs> so this uh, this is part of the set that was never supposed to be shot. Um, it was just background. But Spike. Given his way, we'll shoot everything, everywhere. It's like a little playground for him. Uh, so he shot a scene in there, and he shot another scene in another area that was way too small to shoot, but he crammed a three-person scene into it somehow. So there's the ceilings you can see lit completely for, for the day. And, but he still had to add. You see the egg crate up there. He still had to add a little bit. Sergeant's office. So 
So I walked in here one day and I'm looking at the boxes on the shelves and one of the boxes said cell phone batteries. It's 1972. <laughs> like, you guys, cell phone batteries? So here's a quick walkthrough of the set. That's Marcy, the art director. So this, this little atrium here, I thought for sure that that was gonna wind up getting cut at some point because it was really just added depth. And I mean, I really liked it because it, it's definitely sold the style of architecture, but I never expected it to make the final version because I thought they would make me cut something. And it was so busy and so frantic that they never asked me to cut that part of the set. So I was like, I'm keeping it, I like it. It's backings outside. That's all um, photographic backings of uh, like um, forest to look like Colorado. Um, we did scout Colorado Springs, Tim and I. So that picture on the wall is one of the photos that I took out in Colorado Springs. Just made it black and white. Um, and then we ran into a little bit of trouble here because our, we put a couple pieces of art on the set that were not cleared and I didn't find out until after the fact they were not cleared. So they had to CG them out. It's bad, very bad. See all the details, we got like receipts on the counter, got all the boxes, please don't say cell phones anywhere. All the records. There's not much in these boxes. They're just, there's like one folder right in the front just to make it look like there's stuff inside. Um, but that's a little more tricked out because it's, you know, the closer you get to camera, the more you want to actually dress things and make it, make it feel real. And the actors respond to that also. It's important that you give them real things to, to hold and touch and feel and it makes, it makes them do, do better work also. So theoretically, you, you would never, you'd never walk from what that part of the set, from the, uh, from the intelligence part, into this basement without going up and down the stairs. Um, they're supposed to be separated. So we, so we did do some, some different work here to make sure that you could not see into this space from that space, trying to keep them separate geographically in the building. And there's Ron's desk. My daughters are here, they, they have the typewriter. <laughs> Ron's typewriter at home. So anybody guess how much the set cost? Anybody, any ideas? Yeah? What do you think? No? What do you think? Throw a number out. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Millions a good guess, but we did it for 285. <laughs> and we had to, because otherwise we would not have made it. Two hundred eighty-five thousand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. No, no. We just had a very hardworking. I like. I don't know how they did it, frankly. Like I thought it would, I thought it would come in more like 350, 400, um, but they they just crushed it. I had I had an amazing crew. Um, I had a guy who was a new construction coordinator, so he was really excited about the job and really wanted to, you know, break in and do something big and really good. And so he pushed his guys and and gals, and and we we got it all done. Uh, okay, so we'll cruise through some of the other sets. This is Freedom House. This is Reference. Um, 
everything we do is based on research, visual, visual research. We have to research everything heavily. Even the really unpleasant stuff, we have to research heavily. Um, so this is our location. This is in Ditmas Park. Uh, and that's what it looked like on the day. Harry Belafonte was involved in this scene. Um, the day that he came to set, we had him for one day, and everybody dressed up. And uh, everybody wore sort of Sunday clothes. Um, so everyone was in a suit or a dress, and, and uh, it just made the day more special. He's a very special guy. Um, and he, you know, we, we were paying respect to him. There was also, um, we painted that house, uh, we painted that room black, and that was based on a picture. And uh, we're looking at, I'm looking at a picture with Spike of the research, and he's like, yeah, paint the walls black. I said, Spike, that's a black and white picture. <laughs> but the wall, I, you can't say that wall is black. He's like, paint the wall black. It's like, all right, all right, but uh, whatever. Um, so uh, KKK, exterior, interior. This, uh, this is reference from my set design, set, uh, set decorator, Kathy. The top left one is from another movie I worked on called The Help. Um, we use this reference for this set. So this set we use the basement. This is location. It looks like a set, but it's a location. We use the garage. And we used the rest of their basement, which looked just like this. Like I almost, uh, we had to do very little to make this. Uh, I mean, they didn't have any of the KKK stuff in it, obviously. Um, <laughs> Was it, and the cool thing was it was an African-American family um, who owned this house and then their daughter came and worked on She's Gotta Have It 2, season two, uh, in the art department. So it, uh, it, it paid back. The idea for this set was really to show it as, a, as an information hub where they're trying to disseminate information to, uh, to the rest of the world. Um, they w it, if it were modern day, they'd have like servers down there, big servers doing bad things. Um, instead, it's a mimeograph machine, which you guys have no idea what that is, but it's like a, it's like a very primitive uh, copy machine that smells great. <laughs> uh, this actually wound up being one of my favorite scenes in the movie just because it's so terrifying. Um, and so simple, and he never leaves that one shot, and he just lets them speak their horrible, horrible truth that they, that they believe. And uh, it's just, it's, it's quiet and it's still, and you know, Spike's a pretty cutty director, but I thought his choice to just stay on this and let them play this scene without, good, without doing anything else, I thought it was really, really great. And, we dressed the whole room, of course, but it was we could have just put the headboard there and a piece of green wall, and we would have been fine. That's what happens. Here's the living room. Same house. Uh, this is a pool hall. This is in Williamsburg. We found a bar that we liked. This is the back room of the same bar. David Duke's office, if you walked out of the back hall of the intelligence uh, area, of the precinct, you walk right into David Duke's office. This was on stage. Uh, and that, that uh, the flag behind him, he used to dangle out the side of his car when he was on um, patrol, David Duke. The diner. This is the dive bar from the end. This is in um, Red Hook. And the, the woman who owned the bar uh, said, I have a couple of apartments upstairs. You guys want to look at them? And I hadn't found Ron's apartment yet. And I was like, sure, why not? So we go upstairs, and the first apartment is like a typical Brooklyn Airbnb, kind of all finished and tin ceilings and stuff, and just looked very Brooklyn. And I'm like, no, nah, it's not really going to work. The second one, we walked up the stairs, and it was, um, it was completely gutted, total mess. And the third floor was Ron's apartment as you see it in the film. 
perfect 70s apartment. And she was gonna start demo on it two days later. And I said, don't touch anything. We're using it just the way it is. It was, it's, it's brilliant. Um, FBI meetup, this is up in Haverstar, New York. Could be Colorado though, right? Firing range, this, um, we were gonna do this at a park, but Spike didn't wanna do any of this work on public land, so we, we took it to someplace more private on uh, someone's farm for obvious reasons. We had to burn a cross. We burned a cross later that night also, so private land was a better idea. <laughs> um, yeah, Colorado College Library. This is the, um, anybody know this room? Brooklyn Historical Society in uh, Brooklyn Heights? Mm, does anybody know where that machine is? Microfilm. Microfiche, yes, microfilm, microfiche machine. Um, hard to find these days, but we, we tracked one down and we had a company that actually made us the right, the right microfiche. Uh, it's a, what you do is like, it, before there was digitizing things, you used to, they would take pictures of these things in, in high res and like shrink them down so they're like this big. The text gets, you know, like a whole page of text gets to be like this big. And then you use this machine to magnify it onto the machine. It's, it was a, a way of archiving material. I can't believe I just had to explain that. So we have archiving materials back in the day. Um, Bell's Nightingale, this is also, uh, this is Brooklyn. This is, in, um, this is in Gowanus. And this is a club uh, nearby. We did, the, we did the exterior and the interior two different places. This is an amazing scene too. Do you remember, uh, speaking of sound, um, do you remember, anybody remember hearing boom shakalaka yeah. during this? Yeah. yeah. Do you know who that is? That's what? Spike. <laughs> That's Spike. That's Spike. There's four boom shakalakas and uh, he, it's Spike every time. <laughs> I love that scene too. Uh, this we did in, in pre-production. We did this before we even started uh, shooting. So Spike likes to try and knock something out and get everyone like get get everyone going early. Um, and so we did this sequence in uh, like half a day at, at 40 Acres, which is Spike's office in uh, Fort Greene, with that guy. Ron's apartment, this is in Colorado Springs. This is from our scout out there, so we tried to find something similar to this. We never really saw the exterior. I think that piece got cut. Um, but this is our vibe sheet off of it. This is from, um, we used Ebony and Jet Magazine as, as sources of inspiration. Um, Marcy, the costume designer, mined this stuff, and she also went, I think she's, oh God, she's gonna kill me if I get her college right wrong. I think she went to Howard. And she went to the Howard archives and got a bunch of stuff out of the Howard archives also. Um, so yeah, this was, this is, you know, the progressive 70s. This is the cool 70s look. Um, and that's what Ron's is. And if you look at Felix's, it's way different. Not nearly as interesting and groovy. So this was some of the furniture that we grabbed. And this was the apartment, which, had the carpet already, those louvers there, I could not have made that up. It's just too, too good. Those were there already, and all the wood paneling was there already. We, just, we had some minor modifications to do to the place, but it was a gift having something like that. Here's the traffic stop. We did that in Prospect Park, in the old transverse in Prospect Park. Cross burning on the same property where we did the firing range. And then the initiation, this was, the exterior was out in um, Ossining as well, but the interior was at a, at a church, Cadman Church in, um, in Greenpoint, in Fort Greene. Um, so we used this as the banquet hall, and that's the hallway at the same location. And then downstairs they had a basement. So in the basement, we built the area where Ron looks down to look on, on the proceedings here. We, could, I, we tried and tried and tried to find a place where we could get that geography where Ron could see into that set um, to see what was happening and we could see from them to him in the background. 
it's nearly impossible to find. So we decided to build it into this, this bigger room and we had this church to work in, which was great and ironic. There he is, there's Ron up there on the top. So that whole wall and you know, if you look back to the left, that's the wall of the location. We built a room behind it up a set of stairs for Ron to look down into. So those are the kinds of things that you have to do to these locations to make them work for the script. Now we painted it all together. That's just between takes. That was not a, that was not part of the show. There's Spike. <laughs> and then this was uh, the big explosion at the end, which we, um, we did that day one of shooting, which is brave. But the other, the other part of that is, uh, if it screws up, you have the rest of the schedule to fix it. If you wait to do the big stunt until the end, you get in trouble. Boom. I was an English major in undergrad, but I was a theater kid uh, growing up. I did a lot of theater. I acted a lot in theater. Um, Came to New York, I was a teacher at Horace Mann. Um, I taught theater and I did a little acting on the side. Really didn't feel like I had control of that um, part of the business. Like, uh, I can redesign a set 20 times, but I can't redesign this. So, well, you can, but you know, only, <laughs> only so much. So I didn't feel like, you know, that I could control the acting part of things. And uh, so I started working backstage a little bit more um, and found that I really enjoyed that. And then uh, after teaching for five years, I was, you know, a little bit late going to grad school, but I, that's when I went to grad school after undergrad five years grad school in LA. Um, I went to grad school for theater for theater design, that's pretty typical. That's one path for, for designers. The other is art school. Another is, we have a lot of frustrated architects in our business, because architecture takes so long to get a project up and off the ground and built and all that stuff. We do the same thing in you know, a matter of weeks. We do the same gestures that, they're, that it will take them years and years to do, because the back of it doesn't matter, and you don't have to have HVAC systems and all that other stuff that goes into building, so it's a much faster discipline. Um, so those are the basic paths, but yeah, after grad school, I was never back in a theater without a ticket. It was all film stuff. I, right out of school, I, I got a job PAing on um, a movie called Criminal, which was Soderbergh's first AD was doing this movie with uh, Diego Luna was in it and John C. Riley and uh, it was great. It was great. I was learning on the front lines with a designer who um, he did the whole Hunger Games series and he did all of uh, Soderbergh's other movies. So I was in with a really good designer and then from there uh, I got into the union about a year later and um, it was great. And then I got on War of the Worlds very early on, which was a massive studio picture, Tom Cruise, uh, you know, gigantic. And that that gave me some credibility, even though I really didn't have it at that point. But they're like, oh, you worked on this big show. You can work on another big show and all that stuff. So my advice is if you're if you're going to try and come up through, you know, through PA and get on the biggest show you can. And the reason for that is you meet the most people and your network expands immediately and in a very big way. So War of the Worlds was great for me because there were five art directors. And I would just go into their office and be like, how did you get here? What did you do to, you know, what was your path? And I would just go visit all their offices. I did that when I was a PA also. I would just like sit down in people's office, oh, tell me about your life. And they would, they would love to tell me how they got there. This one guy, I walked into his office and he's like, let me tell you something. I'm the Tom Cruise of set designers. So, oh, all right. Okay, so, you know, and he was, he was like the top dog set designer. And he actually told, a, told someone he was making his deal with one day, like, I'm the Tom Cruise of set designers. And the guy like almost threw his, you know, spit his coffee out. <laughs> All right, last story. So, War of the, this is a War, War of the World story. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, I'm on the lot, 
having a lot of fun. Steven Spielberg is doing previs in the room, like right across from my office. So um, listening to him, like take phone calls from his wife and stuff, and we're, we're like cupped to the wall, listening to you know how he's putting. He was laying out all the big action sequences in the computer in this in this program called Maya, but that's not the story. But okay, so we're outside. We're having lunch one day, and the tram that takes the backstage tour at Universal Studios is going by. And um, they're like, you know, this is the Shoah Foundation. I have a microphone. This is the Shoah Foundation on your right. And this is where, um, you know, the Holocaust survivors have chronicled their stories. And everyone's like, ooh. And they look this way at this building, um, the Edith Head building. On the left of the tram, Steven Spielberg and Tom Cruise were playing catch. <laughs> Nobody saw it. <laughs> so look around you. Um, that's it. Thank you. It's very fun. <laughs>